Welcome. This is David Bowles, Human Meme. Today, Clefcorn and Stubblefield at the Platte Valley Press. William Clefcorn and Charles Stubblefield. Always Bill, rarely Charlie. Bill Clefcorn taught poetry at Nebraska Westland for something like half a century. Charles Stubblefield taught English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, teaching a little bit of everything, really, for about a hundred years. Bill was the poet laureate of the great state of Nebraska. Well, actually, state poet. Please listen to my previous yearning podcast for a bit of a longer rant on lifetime appointments in perpetuity as the poet laureate of the great state of Nebraska. But as state poet, Bill served a lifetime appointment, and those after him will serve a five-year term. So perpetuity is going backward. Together, Bill and Charles were wildfire. They published together, they were friends, they were poets, they invented a publishing house so they could spread into the world their mimetic, their taste, what they wanted to read. It was called the Platte Valley Press. And they published their work and the work of their best students and friends. The Platte Valley Press was an entrepot, a deep water port of thought and grace and good and trained taste. Bill and Charles taught together during the summer, and that's how I originally met both of them together as one when I was a student. They kind of were teaching a master class, workshop, poetry slam at UNL, and it was compressed, it was fast, it was a four-hour class, and it was wonderful. Here's a side note. Always go to summer school. It's faster, it's cheaper, you get in and out really fast and quick. And if you are a freshman, do everything you can to take advanced classes. I was supposed to be taking 100 level classes. I quickly discovered the challenge and the beauty of the university was in the 400 level classes, graduate classes. And at that time, thinking and education was wonderful, not necessarily always for profit. All you needed was a signature, that was enough permission. There were no computers or computer drives. You couldn't get blocked by a machine. If the teacher, a person, liked you and wanted to help you, you were in. Okay, now back to Charles and Bill. Their summer class was a spectacular blend of new and old writing talent. And I remember how amazing it was one day when Bill Clefcorn showed us one of his most lovely poems as it progressed from first draft to second. There were 15 drafts, and we read each one, and each draft was really different from the previous one. And there was scribbling and writing out and changes that were handwritten and not typed. And that was stunning because it showed us, the students, that writing was a messy and disinviting process. Now, later on in my own minimal teaching career, I shared that method with my students. I showed them my raw work and how I changed it and how I fixed it, and my students, like me before, could not believe that my work was just as sloppy as their work. 
and the only real difference was in the wisdom of revision. And you only get that over time in blood-filled satchels you have to drink and then disembibe. Yes, that is the writer's life. Ingenuity in revulsion and revision. Bill Clefcorn often invited us, his students, over to his house. Now, I was lucky because I could walk over. I lived about three blocks from him, and he was well-known in the neighborhood. He was a local superstar. And Bill would read us his works in progress and mentor us, and I really knew Bill all of my life. He was a family friend. I loved his poetry. He was always a perfect and shining example of kindness and insight of the horror just living below our leafy substances. As a child, Bill drowned and died, pretty much, and then was revived. And that unexplainable exploitation of a boy's uninvincibility stayed with him for the rest of his life and influenced every word he wrote. After that wild summer of poetic discovery with Bill and Charles, I took at least three more courses with Charles at UNL. There was an independent writing course he mentored for me, a master class on Mark Twain, and another semester-long workshop discovering the history of American humor. Charles was always happy, a forever smile on his face. And when he'd read passages of Mark Twain in his famous Texas drawl and his infamous laugh and howl and giggle at everything he read aloud. He was crazy about Mark Twain, and we loved Charles, and so we ended up laughing right along with him at Twain's wise insights and jokes. It wasn't enough for Charles just to teach us Mark Twain. He wanted us to dissect the writing, to learn how the humor could cut a man and wound a woman, that even in the midst of laughter, there was always a darker, more unkind side sitting right there on the page from Twain, waiting for our attention. Just as soon as we wiped the spit from our mouths from all the laughing, and silliness. Charles Stubblefield had a very unique office. He was at one end of the second floor corridor of Andrews Hall, basically the English department main office. And when he was in, his door was always open, kind of making an unmistakable office into a hallway, shotgun corridor. He ruled the second floor. When he was available, the entire building belonged to him. One day, as I was sitting in Charles's office, the phone rang. Now, this was an old-fashioned phone with a really loud bell ringer. It rang and rang, and I stopped talking so he could answer the phone. Charles yelled over the ringing of the phone, go on, go on. And I said, no, no, it's fine, go ahead, answer the phone. And Charles looked at me and again shouted over the ringing phone, I'm talking to you now, they can wait. Well, I tried to keep talking, but the phone kept ringing and now my ears were ringing. And Charles just sat there looking at me patiently waiting for me to get it all back together so we could continue our conversation. Finally, after about ten minutes of that ringing phone and Charles staring at me from behind his desk, the phone stopped ringing. 
There was no transfer to voicemail back then. Your phone rang, you either answered it or you didn't. And when the phone stopped, Charles said, See, I told you they'll call back. He smiled, we laughed, and we continued our conversation. Charles Stubblefield was also the one instructor who, in 1985 or so, got me into computers for the first time. Now, this old fella, now those are his words, not mine, born in Dallas, Texas, was a computer genius. He had a K-Pro computer in his office, and with his help and advice, I, too, soon had a K-Pro 2X in my home. And wow, what a learning curve. The K-Pro the computer, changed the way I thought and wrote and revised, and it freed me in many traditional ways. I also wrote my first term paper for Charles on that machine, and it did not go well. A five-page critical analysis essay became 100 printed pages, with approximately two sentences on each page. I had tried to print it and reprint it. I think I was a thousand pages into it when I just decided to go to him and ask for help. So I showed these hundred pages to Charles and tried to explain what had happened with the Daisy Wheel printer and the cable. (sighs) And he kindly looked up at me with that wide grin and glintering eye and said, It looks perfect to me. As I talk with you now, it's a tough loss to realize both Bill Clefcorn and Charles Stubblefield are gone. Bill died in 2011. He was 78. Charles died last December in 2015. He was 93 years old. As a teacher, I often wonder what happened to my students. Where are they now? What are they thinking? And yet, you rarely hear from any of them. And you sometimes think if you didn't maybe do a good enough job for them to stay in touch, And then you quickly realize and correct yourself that your job was to set them free, not to tie them back to you. And then you also really begin to realize that you, me, never got back in touch with Bill or Charles again. Even though I thought of them often, Every day, they influenced me and my writing with their blessings. And that is a terrible shame of mine that cannot be rectified now that they're dead. And yet Bill Clefcorn and Charles Stubblefield, even in death, keep on teaching, asking you to always be aware and be in touch and to close circles, and to cherish what is left, and to know what can never be lost, and accept what will always be recovered. Thank you for listening. Be a human meme.